So uh, we thought we'd talk a little bit about the Liahona with Lehi and the interpreters with Joseph Smith. Now, uh, as we talk about occasionally, there's the pattern of the three prophets, uh, the messenger or the Elijah, the... Um, the mighty and strong. Yeah, the, the mighty and strong one. The preparer. Um, the preparer. The preparer. Um, or the Elisha. Um, or and then the Redeemer, which is the third. Uh, and in this pattern of three with Lehi, Lehi is the messenger. Uh, Nephi is the preparer, and Jacob is the redeemer. Um, just like with, uh, just like with, um, just like with Moses, Jethro was the messenger. Moses is the is the preparer, and and Joshua is the is the redeemer of the promise unto Israel. Correct. And in our day. Joseph Smith is the messenger. The mighty and strong one will be coming. And then the Redeemer, uh, that one's easy to know who it is. That one's Yeshua. <laughs> so, um, Just but, like it was at the meridian of time. Co correct. Uh, there's been other Redeemers uh, throughout time. Including um, Isaiah. Yeah, he was a half of one. Um, and uh, Hezekiah was the other half. Correct. Uh, and and like with John the Baptist, I see him as a half of a uh, preparer, reminding strong one, because Paul is the other half. Um, but that's another subject. But here is something that relates to two messengers. Um, and so um, first, I think maybe just start off with how, oh, I don't know. Where's, what was the first verse talks about the Liahona? Was it verse 10? Yeah, there we go. Um, maybe we just read what the Liahona is. Um, so, Zach, you want to read verse 10 for us? Sure. It came to pass that as my father arose in the morning and went forth to the tent door, to his astonishment, he beheld that upon he beheld upon the ground a round ball, a curious workmanship, and it was of fine brass. And within the ball were two spindles, and the one pointed the way whether we should go into the wilderness. So, a, a couple of things that uh, I think is kind of cool. Uh, one is what it's made out of, mm -hmm. brass. Uh, and brass is symbolic of judgment. Yes. Um, which also goes along with how uh, in other aspects of the Liahona, it represents the Holy Spirit slash Torah, as we'll yeah. get into more later. Well, yeah, yeah, this is something that I that I noticed uh, even before I started coming to Torah, as it seemed like the iron rod represented like the word uh before before I realized the Torah and the Holy Spirit were simply manifestations of the same thing, uh, which is the mind and will of Yopa, I uh, I I saw the iron I saw the iron rod as a manif as like representing the Word, the Scriptures, uh, and the Liahona as uh, the Spirit. Uh, realizing now that the scriptures and the spirit are simply uh two uh, two manifest uh, the scriptures and the and the uh and the light that we were the light and, and revelation that we receive from the spirit are simply two manifestations of the same thing which is the ruach hapadesh right I, I think uh like the iron rod is focusing one aspect and the brass liahona or even just simply the brass is focusing on another yes um, but also um we'll look at alma we'll probably look at alma 37 later but one thing that's interesting that goes along with this is how the brass plates 
aka primarily the Old Testament, including Torah, um, will cause people to want to repent, meaning it's showing the judgments, hence it's metal that is made out of brass is showing judgments. Um, so just kind of go along with uh, the brass more. Yes. Uh, uh, round ball, generally speaking, has to do more with heavenly things, right? Now here's now here's just a funny little thought that I've always had. It says within the ball were two spindles, and the one pointed the way whether we should go into the wilderness. I've always wondered what did the other one point to. Yeah, I I haven't figured that one out myself. So. <laughs> um just a little just a funny little thing that i that i always think of whenever i read this verse is well where was the other one pointing yeah i i i do wonder about the second spindle and i have not figured it out <laughs> so sadly i i'm not able to help you with that one at this point <laughs> um it, 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 but it, it, i always uh i it's one of those things that I always think about whenever I read that verse. Sure. And, then, and it's also interesting here. It, and it came to pass that my father arose in the morning and went forth to the tent door. So mm -hmm. this tent, he was in the tent on the way out. So in the Tanakh, uh, even just the Torah, the first five books, uh, being inside the tent has to do with studying Torah. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's by accident that's put here because then that's when they're given the spirit to know what to do. When well, you're studying also, Torah, you will then know what to do. Go ahead. It also reminds me of the uh, also reminds me of the commandment that we are to bind the commandments uh upon our hands as frontlets between our eyes and that they are to be uh that they're be to be on the lintels of our doorposts for all of our comings in and going out um and so that it, it does remind me of that uh i i can see that though you, you that is a symbolic commandment not a literal one but yeah i'm well i'm not saying that it's literal yeah, I, i'm making sure it, other people know that yeah that's a it's a it, it, the yeah when the yeah when that commandment was given it's not it was not meant to be literally binding cubes to your hands and your head and placing cubes on the doorstep that you have to kiss. yeah and so we have a teaching about that uh i'll link in the notes so people want to look and and i talk about how that imagery points to satan but anyways mm -hmm. um but yes i i can definitely see with it being at the door could point to that some right yeah. uh but in both aspects, it is uh, pointing to Torah that then you're getting this direction, right? Uh, and it told you the right thing to do, which is what Torah does while we're in the wilderness, which is like the world right now. You know, and the thing is, is that Torah has lots of lots of instructions that are useful in your everyday walk as you're about in the world, as you after after you've left your tent door, uh, and and uh, all all the way through the day until you go back into your tent door, studying Torah. There's tons of instruction within the Torah for your everyday behavior. Correct. Um. So I, another lesson that's not quite, I know that's not quite where we're going with this. But no, no, that's fine. I mean, if you want to do more, we can. Um, but if the, if we're done with that, maybe we go on to the main point I want to bring out. And then we do want to take some more time and just maybe read Alma 37 on. And maybe also go point, ahead, out, point out by, by Ben's comment. He's, he's not referring to Talmud crap. Oh, no. oh yes thank you thank you zach yes I'm, I'm, I'm not referring to the talmud yeah so uh it is interesting here what uh yahweh did with this uh leahona from time to time 
And I, I'll read this. And there's a couple of verses that has it. So maybe we'll take turns reading. I'll start. So verse 26. And it, oh, this is uh, 1 Nephi 16, if I forgot to mention. And it came to pass that the voice of Yahweh said unto him, uh, and that's going to be Lehi, I believe. Yes. Uh, look upon the ball and behold the things which are written. So um, Lehi had to read the uh, inscriptions, words upon the Lehona. Uh, I mean, that's pretty basic there. Uh, ben, you want to read 27? And it came to pass that when my father beheld the things which were written upon the ball, he did fear and tremble exceedingly. And also my brethren and the sons of Ishmael and our wives. So it seems to me that he was seeing judgment written upon the ball. So th this, uh, yeah, with the word tremble, I would say it's the normal fear uh, or the Greek fear. Yep. But uh, the word behind fear can be revere. And this is where you have to take context and account. But with the tremble, yes, that would be fear. So, yeah, I would go along with judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, Zach, you want to read 28? And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the pointers which were in the ball, that they did work according to the faith and diligence and heed, which we did give unto them. Oh, that reminds me of Doctrine and Covenants, Section 8, about how we receive revelation. Well, let's go look at that real quick. This is given to Oliver Cowdery after he failed to properly use the interpreters. So do you have a particular uh, okay. verse? Okay, hold still. Let me... Okay, so let me pause while we find the one we want. Okay. Okay, so we found what Ben was thinking of, and it's uh, D&C 9. Yeah, not 8, 9. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Yeah, right uh, we'll it will we'll start in verse seven. Behold, you have not understood. You have supposed that I would give it unto you when you took no thought, save it was to ask me. But behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind, i.e., give due heed and diligence and faithful study. But then you must ask me if it be right, and if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. But if it be not right, uh, you shall have no such feelings, but you shall have a stupor of thought, which shall cause you to forget the thing which is wrong. Therefore, you cannot write that which is sacred, save it be given you from me. Now, if you had known this, you could have translated. Nevertheless, it is not expedient that you should translate now. So, if he had paid sufficient, given sufficient faith and diligence instead of just sitting there emptying his mind and hoping and expecting God to give it to him in the in a uh, which by the way is actually kind of a it's a common misunderstanding with people that we we think that in order to receive things from God we need to empty our minds but our minds need to be uh, on Torah and we need to be uh we need to be contemplating his mind and will if we wish to receive things from Yilfot Elohim, and that's what this is bringing out. Right, that you need to try to figure out yourself first, um, not just do nothing and just say, just give it to me. Right, and the and, the, and so the, and, you know, and uh, studying out and uh, this faith and diligence, the studying it out in your mind does not mean when a new idea is presented to you, um, that you don't look at its counterpart, and uh, immediately, because you felt really good about it, that means it must be true. That's um, This is not appropriately studying things out in your mind. This is not being a Berean. Uh, being a Berean is about looking back to the word. Um, and so it's interesting that in the in going back to the Liahona, where we were, that it paid that it worked according to the faith and diligence which I gave unto the words which were written upon it. 
Um, and similarly, it does seem also that um, the interpreters that uh, Joseph Smith, by which Joseph Smith interpreted, uh, uh, translated the Book of Mormon, worked in the same way. Sure, sure. Right. And, and since you're bringing that up a little bit, maybe I'll, I'll get to the point that I wanted to kind of focus on and bring out mainly is how uh, Lehi, a messenger, had a device that he read things off of. So did Joseph Smith. He did it for translation and also just various revelations also. Mm -hmm. And so here are two Elijah's messengers that are doing similar things. Yes. Uh, and did we want to go through 29 too? Uh, might as well. I can read it. And there was also written upon them a new writing, which was plain uh, to be. Yeah. Now, um, plain is a Hebrew idiom for Torah. Now, we do have to take context into account. But I do think with this context, it's talking about how it was related to Torah, what was written. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I would read that. Well, especially in context of which to give us understanding concerning the ways of Yahweh. Yes, thank you. That would. Uh, um, so it's good to add that extra context there. Uh, but it we could reason it without that. But it is good that Ben brings that out because that gives support for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was written and changed from time to time according to the faith and diligence which we gave unto it. So this is it is shown throughout the scriptures that, uh, including with Adam and the Book of Moses and the Israelites during the Exodus, um, they progressed when they gave heed to what he said. But when they didn't, they were cursed. In fact, the fiery serpents is one good example of that. Uh, in addition to also showing how he still had his um, arm stretched out to help them. Okay. Even now, while they were disobeying. Right. And in, in addition to that, um, I would say that those who have exhibited the signs that follow those that believe have been those who have responded with faith and diligence um onto uh, onto the word onto the word and the revelation of the mind and will of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. and for these people the liahona represents uh, that revelation you don't have to of the mind and will as well as does the brass plates they have both the liahona and the brass plates yeah now this last sentence i i do think it's uh twisted a lot but let's read it real quick and then i'll talk about it and thus we see that by small means yahweh can bring about great things so Everything up to this is talking about the words written upon the Liahona. Mm -hmm. Those are the small and simple things that Yahweh brings about great things. It is his words. Not just it's not a miraculous metal ball. It's the words. It's the words. And it's not doing nice and warm and fuzzy actions for random people. It's obeying his words. That's how great things are brought to pass. Yeah, it's uh, not by doing uh, warm and fuzzy things for random people and making sure that there's a camera available to make sure that it's caught. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so I do want to look at Alma 37. Um, now, in Alma 37, there's this same basic phrase there. 
um, and in Alma 37, it's not being applied to the words from the Liahona, it's being applied to the words in the brass plates, which is Torah. Um, so <laughs> let me, we can go look at that real quick. Let me pause yeah, let's do find the exact verse. Okay, so verses 6 and 7 in Alma 37 talks about the small and simple things, okay? But we do want to start earlier than that, and we're going to start at 2 to give the context of what these small means actually are, okay? That confound the wise. Oh! And that's not just simple random acts of kindness, sorry. Um, it, it, that's words, but let's get the context, okay? So, Zach, you want to read verse 2 for us? And I also command you that he keep a record of this people according as, according as I have done on the plates of Nephi, and keep all these things sacred, which I have kept, even as I have kept them. For it is for a wise purpose that they are kept. So these these are records that contains uh I would well these are the brass plates so these are um Yahweh's words this also has to do with the history of Neph you know the Lehites which also contain Yahweh's words right yeah and so Ben you want to read verse three. And these plates of brass, which contain these engravings, which have the records of the Holy Scriptures upon them, which have the genealogy of our forefathers, even from the beginning. Okay. So brass plates. And okay. so the brass plates is primarily the Old Testament, uh, or you know, also known as the Tanakh. Mm -hmm. And there is no debate in there that there, that's Torah and history that is getting people to remind them to keep Torah, right? Right, and also, and also, there are some uh, prophecies which are cited in the Book of Mormon, which you don't find in our current Bi in our current Bible or the Tanakh, uh, that um, that were also on the brass plates. Right. Um, so the the Tanakh we have today, I think, is. Uh, it's lost documents, and I have a a post about that even sh talks about how uh, the top leaders uh, took books out. I'll put a link to it, mm -hmm. um, so you can go read it. It's got quotes on that. Um, but um, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's the only word of Yahweh Elohim. In fact, the Bible states there's other books that are Yahweh's words that are not in the Bible, showing the Bible is not the only word of Yahweh. So yep. And just which also go which also goes along with its uh companion idea that just because it's not in the Bible does not mean that it is not the word of God. Correct. Correct. Um in fact there are uh there are there there is uh there's much of the word of god that is yet to be revealed including his dealings with all mankind yep uh which kind of goes along with uh second nephi 29 that we're going to get which, more which will reveal to all those who have had who have had faith sufficient to believe on his word uh which will reveal these things will reveal to them his faithfulness in working with all of the children of men and everybody that everybody's had a chance. Um, yeah, which goes along with what Yahweh told uh, Enoch uh, in Moses 7. Yes. <laughs> which goes against baptisms for the dead. But anyways, we're sidetracking. Keep them right. Going. But we're so, sidetracking. We side we sidetrack. We never do that. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, it is related, and we'll, we don't need to go more than that. Um, no, we don't, yeah, we don't need to go any further than that. Yeah, but anyway, so the, these are the records of the Holy Scriptures, genealogy of the forefathers. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's interesting that the, it's interesting that uh, the uh, 
that both of those are considered important enough to be on the plates of brass. Holy scriptures and complete genealogies. That's, uh, that's just uh, right. Um, and I, I think the main reason for the genealogies, genealogies is so people can know their tribe. Yes. In addition, such that they're keeping track of the line of the Messiah. Yes. Because, because of the promises that go along with that. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is a little sidetracked, but it is related just to that statement. Um, the, oh no, I've, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, let me pause one minute. I wish I could help you. Okay, and now I, I can say what's on the tip of my tongue now. Leverett Law, okay? Yeah, Leverett um, Law. So oh. it's interesting. Um, the Book of Ruth has an exam, and uh, I think it's Matthew, but the genealogies of the Messiah in, the, in Matthew, which is related to Ruth, shows... The line went through Boaz, not Ruth's first husband. And Ruth only had one son. So uh, I'm only bringing this up to show that s some people will use lever law more than is justified in the scriptures. Okay. <laughs> Um, because uh, although Leverett Law is true, it's more, it's symbolic, and it didn't do anything with the genealogies, because the genealogy of the Messiah went through Boaz, not Ruth's first husband. Right. And the other thing about that is that... Um... The other thing that Boaz, the example of Ruth and Boaz and the Leveret marriage shows us is that the Leveret marriage could only be redeemed by one still unmarried. Correct. Uh, meaning uh, polygamy is not true. It, meaning that the Leveret law is not a justification for polygamy. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, that, that's probably uh, better, more specific in this case. So, yes. Uh, because that is why the other guy would have been defiled because he already had a wife where whatever would have caused the uh, the closer kin to be defiled did not cause Boaz to be defiled. And that's the only thing is that the closer kin was already married. Mm -hmm. um, because if it was something about Ruth, why didn't it make why didn't it wasn't it a problem with Boaz? But anyways. Mm -hmm. So moving on to four. Uh yes, I think it's uh yeah. is it my turn. Or I think your turn. Or Matt, do you want to read Matt? Yeah. Okay. Verse four, right? Yeah. Here we go. Behold, it has been prophesied by our fathers that they should be kept and handed down from one generation to another and be kept and preserved by the hand of the of Yahweh until they should go forth unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Oh, wait, so this they, is talking, this is not talking Old Testament that's done that. This is talking about the brass plates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that this is also, happened. this is also, it's also extremely important that you realize that this is actually talking about the brass plates and not about the Book of Mormon. Correct. Correct. Um, and the last part is absolutely essential. That they shall know of the mysteries, mysteries contained thereon. <clears throat> oh, so there's mysteries in Torah. Yes. And also, uh, you know, an example of the mystery of mysteries being in the word. Um, now, Alma chapter 40 is an example of mysteries being contained in the word. Yeah, and getting expounded, right? Getting expounded. Yes. Um, it, it's not some new thing out of nowhere. 
And mysteries are contained right. within the word. So the idea that we're constantly evolving and that our new ideas are better than our last ideas, that's Greek. That's Greek uh, philosophy and thought. Right. And that is, you're pretty much stating that what's in the scriptures is not from Yahweh, if that's what you're thinking. Right. Because if it is getting better and no longer relevant, that means it wasn't from Yahweh. So, um, yeah. Anyways, uh, he does reveal new and great things to those who are striving to keep Torah not those who are fighting against it. Yeah. Uh, five, I'll read it. And now behold, if they are kept, they must retain their brightness uh, as in their light, as in Torah is light. Yea, and they shall retain their brightness. Yea, and also shall all the plates which do contain that which is holy writ. So, so, so far, this is actually talking on a couple of levels here. First, he's basically telling him to take care of the records, to correct. make sure that they maintain their appearance and that they maintain and that they are well, i.e. they're well maintained so that they can be easily read. Sure, sure. I agree with that. I was just focusing on the more uh, more important. And of, course, me, the but, spiritual, yeah. and of course, Stephen did a very good job bringing out the spiritual aspect of this to retain their brightness retain the light that is within them and that light is the and that light is the light is, is, that light is the word and the word is the light and life of man so yeah and so uh everything that we've read uh verses two through five has to do with the written word right Yep, yep, but but I have a feeling now that uh, I have a feeling now that people are about to change focus. Uh, yeah, Zach, you want to wrong? Yeah, because that's actually because that's actually what most people do at this point. That's well, I, I, I know, and I'm just saying, Zach, let's prove them wrong. You want to read <laughs> six and seven, Zach? Okay. Now you may suppose that this is foolishness in me, but behold, I say unto you. That by small and simple things are great things brought to pass. And small means in many instances that confound the wise. And Yahweh and Yahweh Elohim doth work by means to bring about his great and eternal purposes. And by very small means the Yahweh doth confound the wise and brings about the salvation of many souls. So here's this um Confounding. I'll I'll tell you. Uh, random acts of kindness are good things to do. Okay, but they don't confound the wise. No. What confounds the wise are the words of Yahweh Elohim. And in fact, maybe let's uh, let's go look at the word confound in the dictionary. Well, the, the interesting thing is, is that these are the wise as to the world. Wise as to the uh, world. Correct, correct. The words of Yoha Elohim uh, often confound them and seem to them as madness or stupid. They don't make sense to the man of the world. And the fact that they make no sense to the man of the world, that obviously means there's something wrong with the words, right? Wrong. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I spelled that right, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Mingle or blend things so their forms cannot be distinguished. Um, no, that one doesn't apply. To throw into disorder. Yeah, that, I, you know, showing how their thoughts are wrong, right? Yep. Uh, to mix or blend, no. To perplex, yes. Um, basically showing how the way that they were thinking was wrong because now they're perplexed or confused, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and it also goes along with of ideas or words, 
And that's what Torah goes out against. And that also goes along with what Paul says, but we're fighting, right? Right. And also, and for and also definition five is really good. Okay, you go ahead and read that one then. To abash, to throw the mind into disorder, to cast down, to make ashamed. So it makes the wise ashamed. It casts it casts these because the the wisdom of the world is disordered to God. And so it casts their wisdom into disorder. Mm -hmm. And uh it casts down their wisdom. And only and only the wisdom of Yopa Elohim is made is exalted in his word. Yeah. Uh and then six actually goes along with what we saw in first Nephi 16, perplexed with terror, right? Yep. And that's words do that. To throw into consternation to stupefy <laughs> just got a lot <laughs> that um that's kind of a funny word but anyways uh with amazement um which that actually kind of goes along with the mighty and strong one and his helper at the end of isaiah 52 when they go out and do missionary work after they're brought back from the dead yep where they they'll teach the kings and they the kings will start believing something that they have never considered right yeah yeah because two people have been brought back from the dead to declare it to them yeah so they, they'll they're gonna have some miraculous reason to uh believe it it but, overthrows their wisdom yes but the was only made possible because those two are keeping Torah such that Yahweh um, gave them power because they're keeping Torah and that the second helper, her, was also keeping Torah to be able to bring them back from the dead. Hey, Stephen. Hey, Stephen. Yeah. Any practical example, maybe? Was, uh, I would like to share an example of this. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, recently, there have, I've had a friend of mine, my my best friend, uh, one who uh, one who gave me support when it seemed as if uh, a lot of my family even had tossed me under the bus, not been here, but just about everybody else. Um, but uh, recently, when I have been uh, trying to live a more Torah-centered life, he has been questioning a lot of the decisions that I have made uh, in regards to living Torah. Um, A.K.A. there are certain decisions that uh, have helped me keep Torah, which he does not he does not agree with, um, and it, it just confounds him, and and it, it's just it he can't describe his bafflement, but yet. I am here to tell you that as I have been living Torah, Yahweh has been hold, upholding us as we live Torah, and he's helped us through uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of things that, I'll be honest with you, if I didn't have Torah and wasn't keeping Torah, I probably would have just, you know, followed my nose and kept doing what I was doing before I was living Torah, which obviously wasn't working. So sure. uh, basically the criticism, he is very much of the world. So those things of the world that are, that bring happiness, they're supposed to bring happiness. There is nothing else that will bring happiness except for those things that the world can offer. Um, and I say to that, my experience, 
recently, that's not the case. As you live Torah, you will receive the inspiration that you need. And when you receive that inspiration, use it, uh, live it, take it, work with it, uh, follow it. And you will be, uh, you will be blessed to overcome everything, uh, overcome those things that may seem impossible. And so I just wanted to go ahead and um, basically say it's actually as you practice Torah and come to Torah and work with Torah, those ideologies of the world and those people who embrace them, even though they may criticize you, it doesn't matter. What does matter is what you do with Yahweh. Um, living his law and uh, that bafflement uh, that it's just you'll dispel the bafflement basically. Sure, sure, sure. And uh, because you're striving to keep Torah, he's helping you that's making these people baffled how in the world it's working, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, which is uh, kind of destroying their logic, right? Mm-hmm. Because they can't make sense out of it as uh they're perplexed <laughs> from definition yep. four for one of them, right? Yep. Or in five, it they're they're like it's in disorder, they, they can't make sense of it, right? Mm -hmm. Um so just uh, I believe you're done, right? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. So that is a good personal example of that in testimony. So on the last definition seven to destroy to overthrow, um, and Yahweh's words will destroy the ways of the world, uh, yep. and I am looking forward to that happening pretty soon. I mean, uh, on a mass scale, okay? Because yeah, yeah Matt has told cool. us one about a personal. Um, scale for him, uh, but I'm talking about a mass one. Um, mm -hmm. So, which I'm looking forward to, and and not. Uh, ultimately, I, I am looking forward to it, but there's going to be some hard parts to it. But uh, and the hardest uh, part is watching people that we care about experience the heartbreak. Yeah. We yeah. don't want the, we don't want people to experience the heartbreak necessarily. We would like people to go ahead. Uh, we would love it if people would embrace the truth now and, and spare themselves the heartbreak. So here's the thing: it's by small and simple things, and this whole passage up to this point, in context, has been about the writings on the brass plates being preserved by taking care of the records and by taking care of the teachings mm -hmm. guarding the teachings we were always supposed to guard torah right and that this uh, small and simple things is the same in alma 37 the teachings of yahweh as it is in first nephi 16 which was the teachings of yahweh Right. Exactly. Only here it's focusing on the brass plates, whereas in the other it's focusing on the Leopono, which brings us back full circle um, again to the interpreters of to the interpreters by which Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. Right. And received some revelations that are recorded in D and C. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh which um shows the pattern of messengers having these devices to bring forth word unto us mm -hmm. right you know, uh, and as we and as we go forward we'll also see that the pattern uh and as and, you know it, it'd be interesting to see what the pattern and the it'll be interesting to see what the pattern is concerning the mighty and strong ones and what they are given because elijah was given Eli, uh, elisha was given 
the Elijah's mantle, literally. Mm -hmm. um, John the Baptist, John the Baptist had nothing more than teachings, the teachings of Torah. Right. Uh, so I think we get uh, through the various mighty strong ones, we get um, different pictures and different parts of that. But I do think the most important portion is how the mighty and strong one gets the message and more fully does the message that the messenger it started right mm -hmm. uh and we can see that even in first or second nephi 3 um that the mighty and strong one will be teaching from the bible which I will all, uh, also state JST of it, and the Book of Mormon, which are things that came through Joseph Smith, the messenger, or Elijah, of our day. Right. Um, yes. I also do believe that Joseph Smith will have a hand in the calling, or at least part of the calling of the Mighty and Strong One, uh, as uh, dictated in a couple of the Mighty and Strong One, or um, in the scriptures, um, I, uh, I, um, Aaron. no, um, Jethro called Moses. Uh, Jethro laid his hands on Moses. Yeah, uh, and then Samuel and put his Elijah, hands on Elijah, David. Elisha. Yeah, Elijah uh, on Elisha. In the DNC, it does state that Joseph Smith will call the next one also. Um, so there's a couple examples from the scriptures. But um, maybe what I would like to do next is look at the description of the Liahona in Alma 37. Okay. Um, and I, it's to me, it's very telling that it uh, resembles the Holy Spirit uh, which is also known as Torah. So uh, let's go to 38 and read through 45. Uh, and I'll, I can start it. And now, my son, I have somewhat to say concerning the thing which our fathers called a ball or a director. Um, so ball uh, has to do with heavenly things versus a square. And a director is something that tells us what to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so one thing in my patriarchal blessing states is that I should study the scriptures to know what to do. Um, so, and you will find Yahweh's words slash Torah, because I, I would consider, I consider all of Yahweh's words that are for eternal and not just punishments as Torah, mm -hmm. um, because Paul and Yeshua both stated that the rest of the whole Tanakh and on top of quote unquote Torah, the first five books is Torah. Um, so, but anyways, uh, continuing on, our fathers called it the Liahona, which being interpreted as a compass, which is something that helps us stay on the path that we need to be on, right? Which goes along with Torah, uh, which tells us how we should walk. And Yahweh prepared it. And Yahweh uh, prepared Torah for us also. Yeah. Um, so for me, 38 really describes Torah in addition to Liahona, but the Liahona points to the Holy Spirit, which I can't... Uh, I know the Book of Mormon somewhere states it does point to the Holy Spirit. I can't remember if it's this passage or another one, but anyways. Um, but the Holy Spirit is Torah. So, Ben, you want to read 39. And behold, there cannot any man work after the manner of so curious a workmanship. And behold, it was prepared to show unto our fathers the course which they should travel in the wilderness. Now, the wilderness is a very symbolic uh, terminology for our life, our test, uh, that while we're here, uh, and we are given uh, this direct, uh, just like Nephi, Lehi and Nephi were given this director uh, to 
take, lead them through the wilderness, we also have directions given to us in the Torah on how to walk out our faith as we're traveling in the wilderness. Right. Um, you know, that's uh, similar. Is, again, I see Torah all over uh, the Leopona. Yeah. Uh, Zach, you want to read 41? I mean, uh, 40, sorry. I need to learn to count. <laughs> and it did work for them according to their faith in the Elohim. Therefore, if they had if they had faith to believe that Elohim should cause what could cause that those spindles should point the way they should go, behold it was done. Therefore they had this they had this miracle, also many other miracles wrought by the power of Elohim day by day. Do you want to say a little bit on it, Zach? Um, I'm not sure what to say. Okay, okay. Uh, that's fine. Did you want to say something, Ben? Yeah, uh, well, what I see here is that the word is as efficacious as the faith that we place in it. Uh, now, it will be it will be it will be used to judge us if we don't place our faith in it. But in terms of getting us to where we need to go, it'll be as efficacious for us as the faith that we place in it. And, and you know, this is why I find the um, in Hebrews chapter chapter three, where it's talking to people about seeing that you know, let us not. Um, yeah, let's go to Hebrews chapter three real quick. Um, Right there, it's towards the end. Um, okay. For we are men. Okay, starting in verse 15. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. How can God will not be, God will not write his, will not write his law upon a hard heart. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. This is Israel in the wilderness provoking their God. Yeah, this is pointed to Mount Sinai when they were breaking the law while Moses was. And it's also and it's also pointing to the fact that they chose to believe the ten negative witnesses and not the two positive ones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see that. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom he was grieved for uh, grieved forty years, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Go on down. I think that's the bottom. No, that's is the bottom. that the bottom? Yeah. Is that the end of it? They could. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You want me to do the next uh, chapter? They could not enter in because lest less let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Oh, 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 oh okay. wait a minute. This I think this is of course I already, I'm just being facetious, but this is stating. That the gospel, the good news that Yeshua paid for our sins was preached to the Israelites that we were just talking about in the wilderness. But it's the not word, new. It's not new. It's not new to Yeshua. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed... Do meaning enter. they did not mixed with meaning they didn't have faith right right they they, they heard the words but they didn't believe it nor were they uh diligent they did not believe in they did not believe in Jehovah. they did not come under his covering yeah in fact at the mount sinai when moses didn't come down quick enough they built an altar of a golden calf and said, this is the this God. This is who brought us out of Egypt. Well, yeah. brought us out of Egypt. Showing they really didn't believe. For we, who, we, for we which have desired, which have believed, do enter into rest. As he said, 
as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Oh, what what was the work that was finished from the foundation of the world? Sorry, Christians, you're not special. It was the atonement. Because yeah. as in Revelations, it brings out that uh, Yeshua was slain from the foundation of the world. For he spake in certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And so this is why we observe the seventh day Sabbath of the new According moon. According to Yahweh's calendar, not man's calendar. Of the, yeah, the seventh day Sabbath of the new moon. Yeah. Because it's according to his calendar. Um, and so those, uh, and, and it, so that we might enter into his rest because we believe. And if you're, and if your and if your belief, according to James chapter two, if your belief is not mingled with actually doing the word, sorry, <laughs> you're just SOL. It's not really faith. Yeah. Faith without works is dead. Um, yeah. Here, anyways. Oh, there. So there. So uh, so this is the thing that. We, so let's go back to Alma chapter thirty-seven. So this is the this is the thing here. Um, that it all works according to our faith, and we need to soften our hearts because God cannot. Because God, it's not that he. Can, it's not that he can't. What he can do with a hard heart is break it. But what he can do with a soft heart that believes is write his law upon it. And then you can become, as you walk according to that law, which is written upon your heart, and as you walk out your faith because you have been redeemed, you can become a son of God. This is the promise that's extended to all people who follow Yeshua in full faith and fellowship. Yeah. Uh, so... If you're done, I'll say just a little bit more. Yep. Uh, so Ether 12, I think, goes along with this very well in that um, Mormon, no, I mean, Moroni brings out how that before a miracle happens, you have to have faith, which and I, I define faith as trust and diligence. Well, um, by the way, that definition is stated openly in Mosiah chapter four. Oh, that's cool. Um, let's go look at that real quick. Because um, <laughs> I didn't know that was there. I kind of put the pieces together. Well, anyway. they, 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 it doesn't exactly say faith, but it, it here here we have Mosiah chapter 4. And we go into, uh, let's see. Right here, let's pause while we're finding. Yeah, let's find it. Oops. Okay. So in verse six, we have this definition of faith um, given uh, of uh, being um, trust, in, trust in trust and trust in Yahweh and diligent in keeping his commandments. I say unto you, if ye have come to a knowledge of the goodness of Elohim and his matchless power and his wisdom and his patience his long suffering towards the children of men i'm reminded of uh, Gen of exodus chapter 34 verses 6 and 7 also the atonement which has been prepared from the foundation of the world that thereby salvation might come unto him that should put his trust in the lord and should be diligent in keeping his commandments and continue in the faith until the end of Even his life. Even unto the end of his life. This is the beginning of the faith. And continue in the faith. Even unto the end of his life. I mean the life of the mortal body. So, although, this is a good find, although it doesn't directly say the word faith, if you know that continuing the faith is going off of what was just right, what is stated. So that's tying faith to that. In addition, you have to have say, uh, faith to gain salvation. 
So even just the salvation here, key word points to it being faith, but then here it's saying, stay, keep doing it. This is stating that faith is trust and diligence. So that's a cool point. <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I kind of reasoned it out out of other things, but that I am going to remember that verse now. <laughs> Anyways. Um, okay. All right. So, uh, so, but just back on what I was saying, Ether 12, that uh, miracles didn't happen until they um, showed forth their faith, which goes along with here as being stated here. And it also, uh, it also goes along with Hebrews chapter 11. Correct. Yes. Um, so anyways, um, is Matt still there? I am. Do you want to read 41? Sure. All right. Nevertheless, because those miracles were worked by small means, it did show unto them marvelous works. And they were they were slothful and forgot to exercise their faith and diligence. And then those marvelous works ceased and they did not progress in their journey. You want to say something about that? So what I take away from that is because they lost, because they lost track. And really that's what slothfulness is. It's, it's losing track. It's losing, it's losing sight of what is most important so they lost track of that faith they lost track of obedience and diligence um and as a result the marvelous works ceased so they lost track of the small things and lost the marvelous works and then they began to see more of the curses because of their losing track and not following in faith. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm seeing remarkable parallels here to the Exodus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, past one and coming one. Right. Um, and also, I think uh, one thing to also to bring out is how because it was wrought by the small thing, keeping Torah because it was brought by by such a simple means they kind of lost track of where it came from no and it also reminds me of this gold uh, reminds me of the brazen serpent in the wilderness mm -hmm. the children of Israel uh were uh bitten by the fiery flying serpent by the fiery serpents and it uh, brought disease upon them all they had to do was look up at the brazen serpent and live. Because of the simpleness of the way, there were many who perished. Yeah. Yeah. And because of the simpleness of the simpleness of Torah. And because of people's desire for mysteries. There will be uh, for mysteries, which Torah contains, but they can't see them because they're looking for something new. Yeah, and Torah has lots of prophecies in it, too, if they want to really keep themselves busy trying to figure stuff out. And we've shared some in various scripture studies, right? But so. many will perish because of the hardness of their hearts and the blindness of their minds when they could have lived. And all they had to do was look to the son who lived the law, who lived Torah perfectly. Who is um, our righteousness uh, if we come unto him and trust him? Yep. Because we're not saved by our righteousness, we're saved by his. Right. And, it, and here's the menstrual rag. Yes. And here's how it, here's how that works. You know, because if you know, suppose we're doing everything right now, we've all sinned, right? So without some sort of mitigating circumstance, even though we're behaving perfectly now according to Torah, 
according to Torah, because we have sinned, we cannot be declared righteous by Torah. Yeah, because we have broken up. Yeah. Only one, there is only one who is righteous. And that is Yahweh Yeshua. Yeah, and um, Torah even explains why uh, Yeshua can do this for us. And it brings out how the head of the household can take on the responsibility of those underneath him. A.K.A. the father has responsibilities for the followers or the children. And he can take upon those burdens. Um, and, then, and then you go into 42 here. Therefore, they tarried in the wilderness. Yes, for 40 years, they tarried in the wilderness. If you're talking about the first Exodus, right. Nephi, and, Le Nephi, uh, Nephi uh, and his family were in the wilderness eight years. Yeah. And then they got on a boat, <laughs> like a baptism. But anyways. Right. But they Therefore did they... I, specifically it's talking about Nephi, but there is the the shadow of the first exodus with Moses. Yeah. Therefore they tarried in the wilderness or did not travel a direct course and were afflicted with hunger and thirst because of their because of their transgressions. Uh, it's also uh sorry, um interjecting, but this reminds me of Yeshua at the well with the woman. The water or the living water will make it so you're not thirst. But because of transgressions, they never will grab onto that living water. Mm -hmm. Which is the right way, uh, a.k.a. Torah. Um, because that is the revelation water that he gives us, and that is also the bread, the commandments, his flesh. Yep. Uh, is the commandments, which goes along with Torah. Yes, uh, indeed. In fact, this also goes to the sacrament. The reason we have the bread first is because before you can't have the wine joy until you start keeping the bread commandments. That's yeah. why that's that order. Well, and, uh, you know, that's, um, and that's one of the reasons why the, uh, that's one of the reasons why the prayer, uh, why the sacramental prayer for blessing the bread has always meant so much to me. Um is because I never knew the joy of my redemption quite so much as I knew it when I started keeping Torah. When I started keeping the commandments. They say that these the wicked say that these commandments are restriction, but they're simply instructions. They're instructions on walking out the life of faith, walking in the spirit. If you do these things, you will always be in the spirit. So I, I will admit that I think uh, restrictions is a valid term for it, but. Uh, the thing is that if you go over these restrictions, these fences, as sometimes referred as, because mm -hmm. we are supposed to put these on the gates, the fences. No, you valid point. Uh, if you go over it, you'll fall into hell. Yeah, I mean, you know. Um, it just like uh, a parent, a good parent anyways, will give commandments to keep their children safe. You know, it's oh, kind of wait a minute. Wait kind a of minute. like kind of like when I kind of like when I tell my son, "Don't touch the stove. That's hot." <laughs> you mean you didn't want him to get burned by hell? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. So what you're saying is, it's also kind of like this idea of if you want to be with God, with Elohim, with Yahweh, in the end, this is the way you should live. If you want right. to be with, if you want to be with Yahweh Elohim right now, yeah, this is the way. This is the way you should live. Yeah, yeah. Good correction. Good correction. 
We're, we're now it, and in the hereafter. And in the here uh, and in the hereafter. But but uh, but I really want to raise that, bring that emphasis to you can be in their presence right now, being in their mind and will. Yeah. Okay. That's, I not that it, not that he was wrong, but simply uh, adding adding to it. Okay, and let me pause. I want to find a passage in Lectures on Faith 7. One second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, Lectures on Faith 7, verse 9. And this goes off and says that um, the way that one person is to be saved is how other people need to be saved. Now, luckily for me... <laughs> and everybody else actually, that um, I don't have to be that way my whole life, just when I die. And I would say from here on out, because the problem is if you try to put off to a deathbed repentance, you haven't become like that. Um, so, but let me read this. Uh, this is Lectures on Faith 7 verse 9. As all the visible creation is an effect of faith, so is salvation also. We mean salvation is most extensive latitude of interpretation, whether it's temporal or spiritual, so both. In, other, in order to have this subject clearly set before the mind, let us ask what situation must a person be in in order to be saved? Or what is the difference between a saved man and one who is not saved? We answer from what we have before seen of the heavenly worlds. They must be persons who can walk by faith, or work by faith, sorry, and who are able by faith to be ministering spirits to them who shall be heirs of salvation. So, Preachers, calling of repentance, helping others become come to the way, which goes with Lectures on Faith 256. But anyways, they must have faith to enable them to act in the presence of Yahweh. Otherwise, they cannot be saved. And what constitute the real difference between a saved person and not a saved one is the difference in degree of their faith. One's faith has become perfect enough to lay hold on to eternal life. Oh, wait a minute. It didn't say uh, a temple ceremony. It said faith. Mm -hmm. And the others has not. But to be a little more particular, let us ask, where shall we find the, a prototype? That's the word I was trying to think of. <laughs> um, uh, not, I was trying to find it with template, but it's prototype. In those likeness may be assimilate uh we may be assimilated yeah assimilated in order that we may be made partakers of life and salvation or in other words where shall we say where shall we find a saved being for if we can find a saved being we may ascertain without much difficulty what all others must be in order to be saved this is stating to be fully saved like celestial glory, a.k.a. Um, sanctification, a.k.a. baptism of the Holy Spirit, we need to be like the Messiah, who are unlike other, cannot both be saved. So um, they must be like that individual or they cannot be saved, we think. Okay, where, where are you? I, I can't. Yeah. Okay. Or, we cannot be saved. We think that it will not be a matter of dispute that two beings who are unlike each other cannot be saved. So two different people, uh, as in this is more focusing on the behavior that if how they treat different people, how they act and how they make decisions, if those are different, they both can't see, be saved. And this is going off the idea the straight and narrow versus the wide and vast, okay? Mm -hmm. The wide and vast is Satan's way. The straight and narrow is Yahweh. So it's saying, because it's straight and narrow, they have to be the same, right? 
For yeah. whatever constitutes the salvation of one will constitute the salvation of every creature which will be saved. Uh, and if we find one saved being in all existence, we may see that all others must be or else not be saved. So we all must be like the Messiah, uh, which uh, goes along for we will, be, we will recognize him for we will be like him. Those who recognize him are the ones that are going to be saved. Mm -hmm. We ask then, where is this, the prototype? Or where is the saved being? We conclude as to the answer of this question, there will be no dispute among those who believe the Bible, that it is the Messiah, Yeshua. Mm -hmm. All will agree in this, that he is the prototype or standard of salvation. Or in other words, that he is a saved being. And if we should continue our interrogation and ask how it is that he is saved, the answer would be because he is just and a holy being. And which goes along with how he states in the Old Testament, be holy be, as I am holy. Be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Is perfect. Uh, and those are saying the same thing on different angles because both are pointing to Torah using different words, right? Um, and if we were anything different from that which he is, he would not be saved. For his salvation depends on his being precisely what he is and nothing else. For it were possible for him to change in the least degree, so sure he would fail of salvation and lose all his dominion, power, and authority, and glory, which constitutes salvation. For salvation consists in the glory, authority, majesty, power, and dominion, which Yahweh possesses, and in nothing else, and no being, sorry, can possess it by himself, or in one like him. Thus saith John in his first epistle, chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, Behold, now we are the sons of Elohim, a.k.a. followers of Elohim, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know him, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and any man that has this hope in him purifies himself, which goes along with sanctification, okay? Which goes along DNC 84. Am I remembering that one right? Yep, 80, 88, 34. Oh, 88, 34. Okay, sorry. Anyways, uh, even as he is pure, why purify himself as he is pure? Because if they do not, they cannot be like him. Nor this can is they... a loaded verse with a lot of truth in here. Um, Nor can they claim to be his disciples? Correct. For they have not disciplined themselves. Right. So there's a difference between believers and disciples. Right. Believers that they believe yes was the promised Messiah. Disciples are ones that are actually taking seriously and applying his ways and his teachings, right? Yeah. Um, so, let's go back to uh, Alma 37. Uh, it's, uh, I think we just read 43, right? We read 42. Oh, 42. Okay, so we're on 43. So I'll, I'll read 43. And now, my son, I would that you should understand these things are not without a shadow. For as our fathers were slothful to give heed to this compass, so... And as their fathers were slothful to give heed unto Moses, the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. So even there was a period of time that even Lehi had a problem following that Nephi kind of brought him back, right? Mm -hmm. um, which I do believe is 1 Nephi 16 also. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
uh, now these things were temporal. They did not prosper, even so it was with things which are spiritual. So this goes along with the statement that's throughout the Book of Mormon, that uh, those who keep Yahweh's commandments will prosper, and those who do not will not see him. Now this prospering doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be rich if you're righteous. No, it, it means he'll take care of you. Yes. Give you your needs. And uh, and that you will be able to have joy in life. Correct. Um, and uh, Matt was just talking about how with keeping Torah, that's happening in a strange way that it's causing people to, to stupor over it. Right? <laughs> so, um, anyways. Uh, but... Um, when you keep his ways, he will help you uh, get what you need. And I can testify to that myself. Okay. He'll take care of you. He won't give you everything you want, but he'll make sure you're taken care of. And if you turn to his ways from your own wicked ways and soften your heart and give faithful heed and diligence to the word, which is Torah, then you have demonstrated your broken heart and contrite spirit. And you have come under his covering. And through his righteousness, you will find joy not only in this life and the things that you need in this life, but his righteousness is all you need for the second, for the, for the, for the next life. And he will cover you. And he will bring you under his wing as a hen gathers her chicks. And you will be his people. And he will be your God. And that is a wonderful thing. You want to read 44 for us, Ben? For behold, it is easy to give heed to the word of, of to the word of Messiah, which will point you a straight course to eternal bliss. Wait, As it, it's not curved then and... straight. Okay. As it was for our fathers to give heed to this compass, which would point them to a straight course in the promised land. So, uh, I mean, I know I was being facetious, but Yahweh's way, Torah, Holy Spirit, or holy behavior is straight and narrow. Just like, and it leads to eternal bliss, just like this compass is um, being uh, a shadow to the word of the Messiah for. And because, and because, and because God is no respecter of persons, the requirements are the same. The basic, the basic requirements are the same for every man. And you're not going to receive any additional missions or callings from him until you've shown at least the desire to obey his tour yeah uh matt are you still there no he's back in the back room no uh zach you will you read 45 now i say is there not a type in this thing or just as surely as director to bring our fathers did bring our fathers by following its course to the promised land show the words of christ or messiah if we follow their course carry us beyond this veil of sorrow into the far better land of promise now uh for me i think that's pretty obviously pointing to how um the word of the messiah yahweh uh, the director, and Torah, they all point us to the land of promise or heaven, mm -hmm. uh, which is Torah. His ways point us mm -hmm. to how to be there, all right? Absolutely. So I, I I think this is a good teaching for today, unless we want to read a few more verses. Well, I'm 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 uh, I I feel good about I feel good about this teaching. I think we, oh. I think we've covered it well. Yeah, yeah. So 
Well, Leahona uh, does point to the Holy Spirit, uh, also known as Yahweh's Word, also known as Torah, and uh, messengers like uh, Lehi and Joseph Smith, who are Elijah's, had these devices that gave them um, words written upon them to help them bring stuff back. And also, connections. Brass plates, brass ball. Yeah. Judgment. Judgment. Yeah. Uh, the, we, we will be judged by the word, whether we give faith and heed to it or not. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, it will direct us surely to a far better land of promise. If we heed and learn from it, uh, if we fight against it, it will, you're just the. It is the it's instrument all come into play. So. It is the instrument by which we will be judged filthy still. Yeah. yeah. When Yeshua fulfilled the law, he simply made it complete in its ability to make men who were like him. Yeah, uh, and if you go look at the Greek underneath that word fulfill, it means to fully preach. Um, mm -hmm. So, and he did that with his life. Um, but there was uh, more importance for him to do it throughout his whole life as he needed to, such that he could be the Messiah. So, um, there's more points to that for him than it is for us. But anyways. Mm -hmm. which actually um, you can get from Torah prophecy of the ram's horn stuck in the bush. Yeah. Thorn, the thorn bush, actually. So, but anyways, um, and speaking of which, as I mentioned before, Torah has prophecies. There is one. It was pointing to the cross. And what he said to his... Uh, Apostles, that he had to do it. Otherwise, they wouldn't get the Holy Spirit. Yep. So, anyways, with that, we'll call it a night. Um, same time next week. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Uh, we'll see you next week. Okay.